think that most people, many people might not realize is actually doing stuff. They think of Microsoft, they think of Windows and Office and this stuff, right? But and machine learning is kind of, and Microsoft Research at least, the name of the game, right? Not only that Microsoft Research, but, but machine learning is actually pervasive throughout pretty much all Microsoft products. So whenever you use a Microsoft product, you're using a system that's been generated by machine learning. So I want to mention, so just, just to set the groundwork here, I mean, we've been talking about, we talk a lot about, it happened at this conference, a lot about insights and using machine learning to, to do clustering and, 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 you know, get business insights. But there's also, you know, machine learning, I think we're, we're, we're the last session, the last couple sessions we're talking about machine learning as something to help you build new products that can automate tasks that kind of make, make work more efficient. Can you, can you talk about the difference between you know, how, how maybe artificial intelligence splits along, along those lines? Sure, I split um, artificial intelligence into three uh, different silos. One is uh, what a lot of the audience works on, which is what I, what I call business intelligence, really trying to gain insights from data or uh, create presentations or make uh, dashboards. So that's a very valuable thing. Uh, but, uh, what I tend to work on is machine learning or data mining, as I call it for this particular uh, subset, which is using data to actually create software. That's, that's how we create a lot of software at Microsoft. So instead of uh, uh, trying to obey a spec, what you do is you gather a data set and you uh, specify the goals of the software on that data set, and then you get it. at the end you get a piece of software that you can ship uh, that was trained on the data set. That's sort of classical machine learning. So you can think of it as a branch of software development. Uh, finally, there is, the, there is the branch of artificial intelligence, and that's what uh, is recently really broken open uh, with a lot of these deep learning techniques where a lot of these classical hard AI problems that are emulating what people can do, things like uh, vision and speech and reading. Uh, in other words, you can, you know, that's one of the old uh, dreams of Bill Gates, computers that can uh, see, hear, and understand. Uh, that's really broken open recently and that's, that's uh, really exciting. And then why is that? Why, why, why did we break open? So recently, right? Because everyone, it seems like, if you have Microsoft, Google, Facebook, yeah, of interest, everyone has a computer vision, bought a vision startup, or bought a researcher, or did something like, what, why, why today? Well, um, a lot of the uh, techniques go back uh, a ways, actually back to the early 90s. And I was actually involved in the field at that time. And it was, um, it was tough because computers were very slow then, and there was not much data. And a lot of these techniques about the neural networks were actually mostly put on the shelf because they were just too slow or not effective enough. And then people have revisited them in the last two, three years. It's because we have much more compute, especially with parallel computing, and much more data that we've gathered. And also many more labels. In other words, a lot of these crowdsourcing uh, labels are very really important. Um, and now that we have all these ingredients, we're getting these spectacular breakthroughs. So for example, um, in speech recognition, there's a standard uh, benchmark called uh, Switchboard, and it was stuck for 10 years. There was no improvement, even though the data set was getting much larger. And then some of the folks uh, from Microsoft Research came in and started applying these deep learning techniques and actually got a reduction, initial reductions of 30% in error rate. This was really a qualitative difference. Um, for example, we had a demo a couple years ago uh, of a speech-to-speech translator that we demo in China with Brash and had a research. And it actually worked for the first time. We actually didn't want to show the demo because the speech recognition just wasn't good enough. And we finally showed it and it really uh, it was it worked. And Rick Rasha was speaking uh, uh, in his own voice in Mandarin to the audience, even though he can't speak Mandarin himself. And it actually brought tears to some people's eyes in the audience. It was so amazing. So so let's talk about that. I mean so speech recognition I think is an obvious application of this that even if people think about it. <laughs> so example, so, when you, so at Microsoft, right, and so last year I spoke with some execs at Microsoft and all they talked about, to talk about was taking data from big, taking data from everything they do and, and applying machine learning and AI and building smart systems. So, I mean, what are some examples, I guess, that if, if people aren't familiar with using Xbox or Office, where, where are you seeing machine learning actually? How is it touching or AI touching you know, parts of your everyday existence? Oh gosh, whenever you use uh, Bing, the search engine, you're using many, many components that are trained in machine learning. I mean, that, that's large amounts of that system are, are all done by machine learning because that's how you can do scale, right? The only way you can answer however many questions Bing answers, billions, 
uh, is to have something that in, in, uh, operates independently, autonomously. Um, Xbox has uh, uh, the Connect was also also trained with machine learning. The, the, the fact that it can see you in the room, even though it's you know poor lighting, you can actually wave your arms and it can track you. That's all done with a machine learning piece of software that was trained in machine learning. Um, another thing I'm actually quite excited by is uh, insecurity. Um, so we actually have a set of malware analysts. We have a bunch of people who are trying to protect uh, you if you use the Windows ecosystem, uh, trying to uh, you know, engage in arms race with the, the bad guys and try to protect your computer. And we actually use machine learning extensively there, both to give analysts sort of like superpowers to make them much more effective at searching through lots of data, and also even autonomously uh, um, helping find uh, find malware authors by themselves. Is the deep learning stuff making its way into products at this point, or I think that's things like the translation API, for example, for Windows Phone. I mean, are these things? I mean, is that is that considered deep learning as as actually a Surfacing products, or oh yes, deep learning is starting to surface in the products. We use uh, if you use the speech recognition either on the, on the Windows Phone or if you uh, use Windows 8, that's totally trained with uh, deep learning, and uh, even it's starting to make its way into the general search products too. So we're starting to use deep learning. Do you have a sense for how how other how, how this would apply in other industries? Because right now it seems like. The big, the big advances of these are, are kind of like we mentioned at Google, at Microsoft, or Facebook, these places. Like, where's the, you know, if I'm a, a business not running a web business, you know, images I need to take or, you know, for search, whatever, where, 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 where does this start applying outside of how good other companies? I mean, the last last couple of sessions were about people talking to some degree about selling AI as an API, right, or providing, making it consumable, you know, just as a, a few lines of code. So, like, what are the applications you see as? Expands. So I, I think that's a very important industry trend that uh, because machine learning is, is tricky. Not all developers can use machine learning. They have to learn a little bit before they, they can start using it effectively. And uh, there are many, many libraries that, that uh, you can use to uh, write machine learning code. Uh, there's even a few, not many, uh, deep learning uh, uh, libraries developers can use. But the deep learning itself is is, is some people call it black magic for trying to get it to work. Um, uh, so I, I suspect that a lot of developers will not be using deep learning directly, but will be consuming web services that were built on top of deep learning. So, for example, you mentioned uh, the translation, uh, the Microsoft Translation API. Uh, for example, if you use the Speech Recognition API, then you'll be calling into a, uh, into a system that was trained in deep learning. So I suspect this trend will continue. That if you're in an industry that's you know not IT, if you don't own a search engine, you'll still be able to help build your line of business apps, calling into services that will be built with deep learning. That'll be a future trend. What might that be? I mean, I think you know we've had like yesterday at MetLife for these types of companies here talking about you know our retailers. You know, I mean, talking about deep learning as something. I mean. We're talking about big data and how we're using big data, right? If we can start deep learning for AI and kind of just holy grail, maybe some of this stuff. And how many you use, how can you how can foresee that being used in, let's say, an auto manufacturer or, or retail setting? So, uh, if you were an auto manufacturer, if you had any, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make something up. I'm not, a, I'm not super familiar with that, that industry, but you may have computer vision problems that are uh, in your assembly line, like you might want the robots to have better vision then you might be able to call into uh, uh, a system that was trained by someone else, or perhaps you would add your own software on top of that. Um, you, you might need, uh, for example, for speech recognition, uh, you might have uh, factory workers who are um, who want, want to interact with the systems just through voice, and then you would just be calling into a speech recognition API, and then maybe wrap some of your own business code around it, or give it, give it a specific um, vocabulary from your, from your own business. So anything where where you can see that oh I want my computers to see listen and understand like uh, in my business that might be specialized in my business then you can imagine calling into an API and a lot of this is future I'm not sort of making up yeah. about the industry I mean does it, do you think it takes a, a mindset shift like I I, I, I kind of equate it maybe in erroneously but to you know robotics and manufacturing it kind of seems like the, the automation of 
of some processes that previously were going to take humans, right? But it's you know it's like it's almost like an efficiency thing rather than an insight thing, as we kind of alluded to before. Is that fair? That's fair. That uh, because machine learning can be used to generate software, then it's scalable. You can actually then have high-speed autonomous decisions made, and and you can actually either take people out of the loop entirely, like for example, a search engine, there's no one there answering the questions, it's all software. Or you can give, make people super efficient, like these uh, analysts who are from malware, and then just make them much, much more efficient than they were previously. So it really is a matter of raising productivity of, of people. All right. do, you, do, you see, do you have a time frame? Like, when I think so right now, I think so many of the applications are consumer, A, because the companies doing them have large consumer interests, and B, because consumers, if something is wrong, I, mean, I love I love that Google can take my pictures of Google uh, and Google Plus, for example, but they're not always right or you know, I mean, included really. So like, do, I mean, is, is right now the, I mean, is, I guess my question is how accurate do these computer vision or speech APIs or whatever have to be for translation stuff until they're actually, you know, certifiable for, you know, the, the use of lack of a better term, mission critical applications or not. Uh, uh, well, so I'm not sure if you want to put them into safety critical applications. Again, a lot of it has to do with the, the business logic that you put around it. But we are starting to see some of these AI systems in certain restricted sets actually approach human behavior, uh, human performance, rather, which is, uh, for example, speech recognition. We're not quite there yet. For clean speech for, for English, we're starting to approach human levels of, of transcriptions. People are not perfect at transcribing. transcribing. They sort of write down what they they would like to hear as opposed to what they actually heard. Uh, in fact, to some extent, there's a there's a really fun uh, uh, challenge out there called the ImageNet Challenge for Doing Recognition, where in fact, in the largest scale, it's about 22,000 classes. And, this, and systems are actually getting better in human performance because the classes are really obscure. Like, you have to distinguish, the system is forced to distinguish between Pembroke Welsh Corkies and Carnegie Welsh Corkies. I don't think I distinguish between the two kinds of dogs, or between king penguins and emperor penguins. But, but the, the, nevertheless, it actually is, is, the system is actually trained to do that. So in some places, it's actually working better than humans because it can keep track of so many different categories. Facebook published a paper recently about the facial recognition of celebrities, and I was like, huh, I could probably do it one-to-one -one if I just saw that, but I don't know, I might not know all the names. <laughs> and take the face. That's right. So, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we have a couple sites left, so I wanted to ask, like, if you were looking at your, I mean, maybe three three industries or applications you're really excited about where this, where this kind of stuff could, could be beneficial in the future, what would they be? Uh, again, going back to the sort of see here and understand, I'm super excited about uh, computers that can see computer vision. Uh, here, in other words, not just speech recognition, but audio processing in general, and text. And that's a, a very, you know, all of our businesses run on text, and that's, you know, maybe, uh, you know, things that can understand semantics of text, I'm super excited. All right, great. That we're out of time, so thank you, John. Thanks.